Welcome to day four of RMC Stuff. Five short videos in five days that don't fit anywhere else on the channel. Enjoy. This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello Cave Dwellers, in today's episode we've got Unfinished Business with Steve Jobs. If you haven't seen my two-part series already on the Next Station Turbo Colour and the history of Next, then do check it out. In it we discover what Steve Jobs got up to when he was ejected from Apple computers, including the development of some quite unique hardware and a forward-thinking operating system to run on it, Next Step. It began with the release of the Next Cube in 1990 and resulted in the software and Steve Jobs under Apple's roof, where Next Step became the foundation for Apple's new operating system, OS X. Meanwhile, little old me in 1993 was getting to grips with my 486 Packard Bell, a machine which featured in another recent video. And on it, I ran MS-DOS and Windows 3.11 like many of you did I'm sure. Windows, an operating system which some of us tolerated, its dominance secured through marketing and business manoeuvres, more so than technical excellence. But what if things were different? What if I had Next Step and not Windows on my Packard Bell? Well, today I'm going to do just that, because here I've got the 486 version of Next Step 3.3, and we're going to install it and see how it compares. First things first then, and it's the installation. The 486 has been upgraded for this video, I'm running an Intel Overdrive DX4 CPU at 100MHz, and we've got 12MB of RAM with a 350MB IDE hard disk. The installation kicks off from a boot floppy, and out of the box only SCSI CD-ROM drives are supported, which is something I don't have, but I have got a disk of extra drivers here, which I can use to install an IDE CD-ROM driver, so that quickly gets us over that hurdle. I've instructed it to use the entire disk and wipe its contents, so it's bye bye to Windows. We're offered a choice of video drivers, but the list is very limited, so if you don't have those listed cards, which I don't unfortunately, we're restricted to the base VGA driver which is black and white, and it's in a 1024 by 768 resolution, which isn't too bad, but the lack of colours will obviously be noticeable. With the base installation complete, we're offered optional extras and languages, which we can deselect to save some disk space. Now if you're thinking of trying this for yourself, then do take a look at OpenStep, which is a spiritual descendant of NextStep, and it can offer a similar experience with a lot more hardware support. But I'm sticking with version 3.3 here because I've got the boxed version, and I want to see how far we can take it for that authentic experience. After copying the optional extras, it's working. And it's an unusual feeling seeing this on a Packard Bell and not a $5,000 Next Station Turbo Color. It's almost like an alternate reality. Yes, the mouse is lacking that silky smooth quality of the real Next hardware, and we're in black and white, but that is like the Next Cube that was originally in black and white. But it did have a quirky 1120x832 resolution, so we've lost some real estate on the screen, but it is very familiar to the experience that I had on the Next Station itself. And lots of familiar programs are here too, like the Mandelbrot application, which is present with a choice of colours. <laughs> and it slowly renders away just as it did on the next hardware. And here it is in all its colourful glory on the Turbo Colour, slightly more impressive. We've also got Boink Out, which I've set to the wimpy setting to handle the clunky mouse movements. Eat your heart out, Minesweeper. And the 3D chess game is here as well, which made its way onto Apple's OS X, so it does look very familiar. But once again, the higher resolution and the colour of the $5,000 Next Station takes the prize if we're putting the two setups head to head. It's not unpleasant though in its uncluttered mono way, the file system explorer is easy to navigate, and it is a true multi-user operating system from the ground up, 
completely unlike Windows 3.11, with super user privileges required for potentially damaging operations, and the terminals there to let you get down and dirty with your Unix commands. While it may not suffer the same instability and blue screens as Windows, it wasn't completely without fault. These old red boxes appearing when I logged out and in again at one stage were an annoyance, but it never once locked up or restarted. So it all felt familiar, but what I was missing from the base installation were the development tools we looked at before, the killer app for the system as used by Tim Berners-Lee in the creation of the World Wide Web. And these are easily added using the built-in package manager and pointing it to the developer's tools pkg file on the included CD. No random DLL files scattered all over the hard disk like Windows, just a nice neat installation and one needed removal. The beauty of Next Step was that it was built to be object oriented from the ground up, creating a rapid development environment of reusable code. We touched on that in my previous Next Station video, and here's a clip from that demonstrated by Michael. Let's open Interface Builder and let us grab a vertical scroll bar like this. We'll make it nice and big. We'll grab a title, and what I'm going to do is create what's known as a connection like this, and this allows one object to send another object a message. It can be another component, or it could take, um, or it could be an Objective C class. But I can take a target. I can tell it take an action. In this case, take float value, and send it to that text field to display information. And as you can see, I did not have to write a single line of code to make this work. I just drag the bar, and the text field right here updates. And that's a demonstration I'm easily able to replicate on the Packard Bell by linking my vertical scroll bar here to a text box. And then we have that same functionality without a single line of code being written. It's a little more cluttered to work on the interface builder in that lower resolution, but it works. And we've not only got a solid OS, but a complete development environment, very quickly installed, fully functional, and infinitely more useful than Windows 3.1.1 out of the box. I'd certainly take this over Packard Bell's Navigator. With the addition of a supported video card giving us a higher resolution and a splash of colour, and a supported sound card, this would be great to look at. As it is though, even in black and white, if you were serious about application development, it's still a clean and usable environment, far more so than Microsoft's offerings at the time, and it's entirely usable on the Packard Bell, at a fifth of the cost of the next hardware. Hardware Next themselves dropped to concentrate solely on software, which is why the OS was broken out onto the architectures other than the Motorola 68K of the Next machines, and eventually adapted to the PowerPC architecture before moving on to Intel. I am obliged, however, to show you one last demonstration on account of the fact that a game was developed on Next hardware, which was released in 1993, the very same year as this Packard Bell. Of course, it's Doom in Fifty Shades of Grey actually running smoother on the Packard Bell than it is on the Next Station Color version. But let's face it, if it's games you wanted, then you would have had MS-DOS on your PC for blasting those imps. Next Step was for altogether more serious purposes, and without a doubt, did it very well indeed. And to think, we could have all been using the grandfather of OS X on our 486s instead of Windows. The OS wars may have looked very different indeed. Thank you for watching, and take care.